Good evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, ASTRO 2021 Peer Review Symposium, Implementing Synergistic Multimodal Approaches with Tumor Treating Fields to Extend Survival in Aggressive Cancers. Uh, my name is Eric Solman. I'm a professor and vice chair of research at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine, and I also co-direct the Brain and Spine Tumor Center there. Uh, and it's a pleasure to chair this event with my colleagues, who I'll introduce in a moment. So I'm going to provide a, a brief introduction to tumor treating fields, a brief overview, and then I'll be speaking about uh, glioblastoma in a minute as well. So the use of tumor treating fields and really the development of the technology goes back uh, even before shown on this graph of, of more than 20 years. Uh, Yoram Palti, uh, uh, originally from Technion in Israel, developed this technology, uh, and it has gone through uh, early uh, human trials in 2004, approval for recurrent glioblastoma from the EF11 trial in 2011, and then approval for newly diagnosed glioblastoma in the EF14 trial in 2015. And then uh, in 2019, approval for mesothelioma, uh, which was the second indication, uh, or the third indication for it. And now there are really a laundry list, a long list of ongoing trials for solid tumors we're going to touch on some of those at the end, but really only get to the tip of the iceberg uh, as the use of tumor treating fields is really exploding. So despite advancements, the utilization of tumor treating fields still is limited. Uh, glioblastoma, which obviously has the longest history of tumor treating field use, only uh, 3 to 12 percent of those with newly diagnosed disease uh, utilize the, the treatment. Uh, and uh, very few uh, also with recurrent disease. Now, the reasons for this are complicated, and we won't get into all of those in this symposium, uh, but what we will address are the best practices for overcoming these challenges and some of the barriers for pres prescribing TT fields for patients with glioblastoma or mesothelioma and preparing to implement novel multimodal strategies in other uh, cancers, and including a lot of the trials that are uh, ongoing right now. So the mechanism of action of tumor treating fields has actually uh, been studied since its earliest days, and there are multiple publications and high-impact journals really going into this. The first mechanism really involved its role in mitosis, uh, and I'm going to show you a video now which kind of summarizes the anti-mitotic uh, role of tumor treating fields. So why don't we switch to that, uh, that video? In metaphase of cell division, Cells are a rounded shape as the mitotic spindle forms. Intracellular components such as macromolecules and organelles are naturally charged. Tumor treating fields, or TT fields, disrupt cancer cell division by physically interacting with molecules required for mitosis. When alternating electric fields are applied to cancer cells, they disrupt microtubule polymerization. Tubulin dimers align with the electric field and are not able to form microtubules. This prevents the organized assembly of the mitotic spindle required for normal cell division. The inhibition of microtubule formation leads to metaphase arrest and cancer cell death. In addition, these deformed microtubules can lead to abnormal DNA segregation between daughter cells, which also results in cancer cell death. TT fields can also affect cells after metaphase. If a cancer cell has passed metaphase and enters the cytokinesis phase, the cell takes on an hourglass shape. This state under TT fields creates a non-uniform electric field inside the cell, creating dielectrophoresis. Net forces push the macromolecules and organelles toward the mitotic furrow, and this disruption leads to structural disorganization and cancer cell death. Transducer arrays can be placed on the scalp, chest, or torso to deliver TT fields that kill cancer cells. The placement of transducer arrays is personalized for each patient. So from a radiation oncology perspective, it's important to think of tumor treating fields as a non-ionizing radiation in the 150 to 200 kilohertz of frequency. Uh, and this is uh, 
useful information to have when speaking to your patient. Uh, and uh, I actually find that referring the frequency of 200,000 hertz and comparing that to the frequency you find in an electric outlet of 60 hertz uh, explains to the patient why we're not going to be sending uh, a lot of electricity through their head, a big current through their head, but really create this electric field because it's switching back and forth so quickly. So this non-ionizing radi radiation, of course, has these antimitotic effects, and there are, in fact, now an abundance of preclinical data which suggests many other effects that lead to uh, arrest of cell growth and to uh, destruction of tumors. And there are a lot of parallels to ionizing radiation, including the post-mitotic cell death that we see, as well as the abnormal chromosome formations, things like anaphase bridges, which are very commonly seen, of course, with ionizing radiation. So one of the key things that's been learned is that uh, tumor-treating fields uh, effect is dependent on, uh, is cell type specific, somewhat dependent on the cell volume. And so for each type of malignancy, there is an optimal frequency that works best. And so the devices that are used have been optimized for that particular diagnosis. It's also worth noting that normal cells uh, tend to respond at a much lower frequency and therefore this really spares normal tissue and improves the therapeutic index that way. So today's agenda, uh, I'll be speaking now about examining the latest evidence and treatment guidelines uh, for uh, tumor treating fields for patients with glioblastoma. Uh, Dr. Kotecha will speak about implementing uh, treatments for malignant pleural mesothelioma and other thoracic cancers. And then Dr. Horn will talk about uh, the ongoing uh, development of trials uh, for treatment of GI and gynecologic cancers. So let's talk about glioblastoma. Uh, as I'm sure uh, all of you know, glioblastoma is uh, perhaps one of the most vexing problems on all of oncology. It is the most common primary brain malignancy in adults. Uh, and the prognostic factors that are most powerful are, of course, patient age, extent of surgical resection, to a lesser extent, tumor location. There are now mo many molecular features that are prognostic, such as IDH status, MGMT promoter methylation status, and patient functional status or performance status. Uh, historically, the poor prognosis uh, was uh, largely associated with the limited treatment options. Of course, this is the brain very difficult area to treat. So how are tumor treating fields delivered for glioblastoma? It is, uh, there is a portable device. It is non-invasive. It localizes the treatments to the operative bed, to the areas at risk. Uh, the overall intensity is typically one to three volts per centimeter. The frequency for glioblastoma is 200 kilohertz, uh, and it's alternated in two different directions. The arrays are applied to the scalp, so the scalp is maintained shaved uh, in order to uh, allow the arrays to adhere to the scalp. And the positioning of the arrays is highly individualized based on the three-dimensional internal anatomy uh, based on an MRI that is submitted uh, after radiation for uh, determination of array placement. So I'm just going to introduce uh, a rather interesting case, not a typical glioblastoma case, 71-year-old woman uh, who actually had a prior diagnosis of a grade 2 meningioma, the right sphenoid wing, in itself a challenging uh, problem. And she was undergoing routine surveillance MRI when she was noted to have T2 flare hyperintensity in the left middle frontal gyrus involving the motor cortex on tractography. Uh, she was other, essentially asymptomatic from this uh, finding. Uh, she underwent a left-sided awake craniotomy and a subtotal resection since there was a lot of flare abnormality that was ultimately discovered. And the pathology came back as glioblastoma, IDH wild type, MGMT methylated, EGFR amplified, TERT promoter mutated. Uh, she was dispositioned to receive uh, standard chemo radiation with, uh, to 60 gray with concurrent temozolomide followed by adjuvant temozolomide with tumor treating fields. So as I mentioned, tumor treating fields are personalized uh, through individual treatment mapping. And based on the MRI, the software generates a layout for how the arrays are placed on the scalp to maximize TT field intensity. 
and uh, really utilizing the MRI images to their fullest. Data for the tr use of uh, TT fields in the treatment of newly diagnosed glioblastoma, uh, really level one data comes from this trial, the EF14 trial, uh, also known as the other STOOP trial. Uh, this is the scheme. Patients uh, were given standard chemo radiation, and like our patient, could be randomized to either getting tumor treating fields with adjuvant temozolomide or, tu or adjuvant temozolomide alone. Uh, the tumor treating field went on until either second progression or 24 months. The uh, adjuvant temozolomide was a standard uh, six month uh, cycles. This is the intent to treat population analysis from the EF14 trial. As you can see, there was a significant survival benefit for those receiving uh, adjuvant tumor treating fields with temozolomide. Uh, the uh, survival at two years for temozolomide alone was 31% versus 43% for the combination therapy. And interestingly, as you go all the way out to five years, you see more than a doubling in survivorship of 13% compared to 5% for the single treatment. The median numbers are 20.9 months for the combined therapy versus 16 months uh, for the uh, temozolomide alone. Uh, this led to uh, approval of the treatment for newly diagnosed glioblastoma. What's also interesting is that in subgroup analyses, the use of tumor treating fields was independent of all the prognostic factors. So regardless of the prognostic factor, there was benefit to adding tumor treating fields to adjuvant temozolomide in all cases, uh, regardless of age, regardless of MGMT status, regardless of extent of resection, regardless of performance status. This led the NCCN to include the use of tumor treating fields as level one evidence in guidelines for uh, methylated and unmethylated newly diagnosed glioblastoma for age less than 70 and for age greater than 70. So in all cases, this was recommended as a uh, treatment. Uh, what was also interesting from that trial was that quality of life was maintained over the 12 months uh, studied. Uh, there was no uh, decrement in quality of life with the use of tumor treating fields, perhaps some uh, mild increase, but overall sustained. And so this is important, particularly the patient reported because many, uh, had concerns that this would be an added burden to patients, having to wear the arrays, having to wear them 18, hour, uh, 18 hours a day, where they wear them all day, but having them connected 18 hours a day, uh, the constant skin care, the constant uh, shaving of the head. And nevertheless, patient-reported uh, outcomes uh, and patient-reported quality of life remain the same as those uh, receiving temozolomide alone. Uh, the survival benefit seem to be correlated to the increase in the use of tumor treating fields. So the longer you used it, the more uh, the survival benefit. At some point, at least in the EF14 trial, uh, there was uh, only a, a minimal gain. It became statistically no, no longer significant when you were at about 50% of the recommended time. Uh, but nevertheless, more was better. Uh, and patients know this, and some patients choose to wear it uh, essentially Ne nearly 24 hours a day. Uh, and a really interesting study by Matt Ballow and colleagues uh, that was published uh, uh, two years ago uh, started to look at the dosimetry. You know, as radiation oncologists, we really want to know what is the dose coming to the, uh, to the tumor bed, to the areas at risk. And uh, looking at the, the local minimal uh, field intensity and the local minimal uh, power density uh, if those air could be higher, so the field density greater than one volt per centimeter, the power density greater than 1.1 milliwatts per centimeter cubed, both of these uh, were had showed a significant survival advantage, uh, really suggesting that the dosimetry is a key component. And indeed, uh, there is a revised version of the treatment planning currently uh, in beta testing to attempt to improve the dosimetry of tumor treating fields in the brain. So uh, what's interesting in this study, also from Matt Ballow's group, uh, and this was presented in abstract form a couple of years ago at this meeting, uh, was that when you looked at the areas uh, that regressed versus the areas that progressed, uh, 
the field dose was higher in the regressed areas than the areas that progressed. Uh, and this is, uh, again, encouraging evidence to suggest that there is truly a dose-response relationship between tumor-treating fields and uh, tumor response. And this is exactly, of course, what we see uh, with ionizing radiation. It really goes on to support this concept of tumor-treating fields being another form of radiation for radiation oncologists to deliver, uh, but in this case, of course, a non-ionizing radiation. Okay, so I'm going to spend a few minutes now talking about some of the emerging uh, trials that involve glioblastoma and tumor treating fields or uh, other tumors in the brain, particularly metastases. So we didn't go through the preclinical data with tumor treating fields and the immune reaction that it elicits, uh, but there's quite a lot of elegant preclinical data to show that indeed uh, treatment tumor treating fields activates the immune response. Uh, and therefore, there are uh, two trials, interesting trials, single arm phase two. One is uh, adjuvant temozolomide with tumor treating fields and pembrolizumab, uh, a PD-1 inhibitor. And of course, the other is tumor treating fields with uh, nivolumab, another PD-1, with or without ipilimumab. And that, of course, is borrowing uh, somewhat from the uh, melanoma and other, and other disease site literature where there's a benefit to combining ipi and nevo. Uh, Looking at uh, other strategies in glioblastoma, the uh, EF33 trial from Novacure is looking at high-density transducer arrays, so really focused on that dosimetry question and looking at it in the recurrent setting in a phase two trial. And because of the scalp uh, irritation that we're gonna talk about in a minute, uh, there is a scalp sparing version of radiation that combines temozolomide and tumor treating fields. Uh, and then in brain metastases, uh, similarly, we're seeing uh, that there's the ongoing phase three METIS trial of patients with non-small cell lung cancer brain METs uh, after radiosurgery to try to reduce the distant brain MET failure rate. And then there are these phase two trials, again, uh, building on the uh, checkpoint inhibitor data from uh, melanoma uh, to uh, combine uh, tumor treating fields. And what's really interesting is looking at small cell because of the rather brain systemic uh, distribution of METs in small cell lung cancer. Uh, so these are some of the trials that are under investigation. Uh, one trial I will highlight is the ongoing Trident trial uh, or EF32 trial. This is a trial where uh, the uh, building on the EF14 trial where tumor treating fields are now added to the concurrent component of treatment. So patients are randomized to receive standard temozolomide with radiation followed by tumor treating fields and temozolomide adjuvantly or adding tumor treating fields to the concurrent phase. And for those of you that may be uh, uh, enrolling patients in this trial, it is quite interesting that all patients do is unplug and then they get radiated right through the arrays. There's a slight difference in the way you simulate the patient uh, to account for the arrays, but otherwise it's a fairly straightforward treatment. Um, and it also worth mentioning that, of course, tumor treating fields and temozolomide in the adjuvant phase are in both randomized groups because tumor treating fields in this context are standard of care. Okay, so one of the things we'll talk about is uh, management of uh, the dermatologic consequences. If there's any toxicity that came up from the EF14 trial, it was uh, skin toxicity. And I think, you know, I'll highlight more the, the middle column here uh, which is really a, a contact dermatitis from the adhesive uh, that comes up from the, uh, from the arrays. Um, and for this, uh, the treatment is, is relatively straightforward. It's the use of topical corticosteroids. Sometimes you treat with antihistamines. Uh, in most situations, uh, high dose or, or um, uh, high percentage corticosteroids really do a, a great job of uh, alleviating the, the contact dermatitis. Uh, clearly, if you have a, a patient with uh, hyperhidrosis, uh, you have to do things uh, to prevent the moisture under the arrays so the arrays adhere properly. And I had a patient that recently uh, had a skin tag that they shaved off when they were shaving their scalp and they ended up with a little trauma on their scalp. Uh, and what you want to do is, of course, you want that to heal, particularly if they're getting, uh, say, on the Trident trial. So you just want to avoid maybe putting the arrays right on that until that heals. Um, always can uh, consult a dermatologist and in your practice it's wonderful if you have a go-to dermatologist that can be trained on the uh, uh, skin sequelae of tumor treating fields that you can use for your patients.
So back to our patient, uh, she indeed developed some contact dermatitis. She was given some, uh, uh, a hydrocortisone was sufficient for her, 1% hydrocortisone, very low intensity uh, on her skin. That was enough in her case to get rid of the contact dermatitis. What you also see here is her TT field usage. And she's an interesting case, so I wanted to highlight that, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Um, so this is just use of topical corticosteroids, uh, and you can see uh, an example of this uh, in the image. Uh, sometimes it's itching, and of course you want the patient not to scratch. Usually the arrays prevent them from scratching, but when they change them, they may do that. They can develop a rash, um, and uh, they can get quite concerned. So again, topical corticosteroids, shift the arrays a little bit to try to alternate where the adhesive is sticking to the scalp. Uh, if things get worse, uh, you can use moist compresses. And in the most severe cases, which are very, very rare, you can look at systemic steroid treatment. Of course, you may be using uh, systemic steroids already in patients uh, undergoing treatment. Okay, this is our patient. And I really wanted to highlight this because for, for the six months of adjuvant therapy when she was getting her adjuvant temozolomide, she was very compliant, a very motivated patient. Uh, and then uh, her, she had some um, unrelated issues that forced her to ha take a big dip. And then she tried to go back up in compliance. Uh, she, she never really got back to where she needed to be. Uh, she had disease progression. So she, this was June 2019. And then in April 2021, she had definitive disease progression. Uh, she underwent in May a re-resection uh, and then uh, has now begun back on... Uh, using the arrays. Um, still having an issue with compliance, uh, but it is worth noting that uh, more would probably be better, but she is 34 months from initial diagnosis, which is really outstanding. Uh, and if she continues with the arrays, she, she will hopefully, after the surgery, continue to do well. She is, of course, being rechallenged with temozolomide after this progression, uh, as that is the indication to combine the two. Okay, so I'm just a, a quick uh, take-home point in our last couple of minutes here. Uh, these are the, the sort of five principles of delivering good TT field therapy. Um, first, the frequency is important. Uh, the, the normal cells uh, uh, have a very low frequency that they work with. The cancer cells are much higher frequencies, and there are frequency-specific, uh, empirically determined uh, frequencies for each malignancy uh, that is treated. Intensity is important, so uh, greater than one volt per centimeter, and so dosimetry is very important, or uh, the, the power density of 1.1 milliwatts per centimeter cubed, uh, and these are goals that may not yet be easily achieved with the current planning system, but something that will be uh, uh, available shortly. Uh, the longer the patient wears the device, perhaps the most important thing, the longer the exposure, uh, the longer their survival. And uh, compliance along with power density really is the best bet. Uh, so really getting the arrays on properly and wearing them as long as possible has the biggest survival impact. Okay, so it's now my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Gotecha, uh, who is the Chief of Radiosurgery in the Department of Radiation Oncology and the Director of CNS Metastasis Program at the Miami Cancer Institute, uh, a part of Baptist Health South Florida. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Salman. So I'm going to be discussing really implementing state-of-the-art multimodal strategies for malignant pleural mesothelioma and other thoracic cancers. We'll start off with a patient case. So this is a patient of mine, an 84-year-old gentleman uh, with malignant pleural mesothelioma. It's actually the first patient that we treated with the device about two years now since its initial approval. He was medically inoperable, unresectable, had epithelioid histology, and disease predominantly in the left hemithorax, as you can see on these uh, sequences from his PET-CT scan. So we'll come back to this, but essentially as we're thinking about the rationale for TT fields use in mesothelioma, a lot of the principles between the treatment of glioblastoma and our course in history and lack of really effective cancer therapeutics in that space really mimic or parallel our experience as well in mesothelioma, going decades without any new available systemic therapies. To date, there still remain limited treatment options available for this patient population, although we do have a recent introduction of immunotherapy into this space, 
And the chemotherapy response rates, which is what most patients are treated with in the rest of the world, are lower than what we experience with our other thoracic malignancies. Now, TT fields can achieve direct tumor kill. This is specific for mesothelioma cells, um, and we've seen this in in vitro, the preclinical studies, both with cell clonogenicity as well as cell viability, and they may also allow for increased efficacy of chemotherapy. Again, this is something that's also been tested, especially with carboplatin, cisplatin, pemetrexid, the chemotherapies that we use for mesothelioma patients. Finally, mesothelioma is a relatively fast-growing tumor, and that may have more rapid tumor death from TT fields when the cells are attempting to divide. There are studies that show that mesothelioma cells are actually more sensitive to TT fields than glioblastoma. And again, we have the evidence now for glioblastoma, and so I'll show you what the clinical evidence we have now in the mesothelioma space. So now, transitioning from the brain to the lungs, now, TT fields are delivered using arrays of insulated transducers that are directly applied to the chest. This is a similar in principle as Dr. Solman mentioned for the brain. So here you can see in this layout uh, the transducer arrays on basically a human anatomy sketch model. Now these are laid out as cross arrays so that the front array on the right side is actually paired with the backed array on the left side and then vice versa. Now, if you're looking at the electric field distribution in the lungs, this is highest in the areas in the mesothelium. And as you can see, it's not uniform across the chest itself. The electric field distribution effectively covers the lung, and therefore it's useful in malignant pleural mesothelioma. And then we'll also transition to how it's used in the lung space as well. Now, as Dr. Selman mentioned, the intensity of TT fields in the lungs crosses that threshold, that barrier of one to four volts per centimeter, which is above the minimum threshold that we need for a tumor response. That field distribution is also higher in the mesothelium than in the lung parenchyma itself. Now, we do personalize these TT fields layouts, just like we think about for GBM patients, um, although unlike an MRI, this is done using a CT scan to help facilitate the TT field's intensities to the anatomical region that we're actually treating. So now I'd like to go over the phase through two um, stellar trial of TT fields and pemetrexid and platinum-based chemotherapy in malignant pleural mesothelioma, really what led to this approval. This was a study in 80 patients um, who had pathologic evidence of unresectable disease, had at least one measurable lesion, and had a good performance status. There are some key exclusion criteria, things that we think about in the clinic as well. You could not be a candidate for curative treatment, for example, with surgery. Patients could not have significant comorbidities as they needed to receive the chemotherapy as well. And they could not have any implanted electronic medical devices, something that we do see more frequently in the chest, for example, with pacemakers and defibrillators. These patients receive TT fields at 150 kilohertz, so that frequency is different for lung and for mesothelioma versus the brain, though they use the same threshold of 18 hours a day. The chemotherapy was pemetrexid and either cisplatin or carboplatin, and they receive this every three weeks for up to six cycles. Similar to how we think about it for brain, the TT fields were continued even after chemotherapy ended until disease progression. Now, the primary endpoint for this study was overall survival, but there were a number of key secondary endpoints as well that are, I think are important to highlight, including overall response rate, progression-free survival, and safety. So with regards to the patient characteristics, the median age was 67, and uh, about 84% of the patients were male, which is consistent with what we see in other mesothelioma studies. Uh, more than half of the patients had an ECOG performance status of zero, and we'll talk about the importance of that later and two-thirds of the patients had epithelioid histology. Now, the median number of TT field cycles in this study were eight. Again, this was considered just like with chemotherapy. Every cycle was 21 days, and the median number of chemotherapy cycles was six. And about two-thirds of the patients actually received carboplatin. Now, the median overall survival in this study it was 18.2 months. Again, this is the primary endpoint for this study. Also, the one-year overall survival was 62%, and the two-year survival was 42%. Now, historically, we have better outcomes with patients who have epithelioid mesothelioma versus non-epithelioid mesothelioma, and this is what we also saw in this study as well. The median survival for those patients who had epithelioid mesothelioma was 21.2 months compared to 12.1 months for those who had non-epithelioid mesothelioma. The median progression-free survival was 7.6 months, and the partial response rate was 
and the disease control rate, something that we'll come back to later, was 97%. So therefore, in conclusion, the threshold for significant extension in overall survival, again, compared to a historical control, as this was a single arm phase two trial, was met, the hazard ratio is 0.66. Now, if we put this in light of the other pivotal mesothelioma studies that have been performed historically or even more recently, they're important to think about the epithelial histology component as that may drive the survival. In this study, it was 66%, two-thirds of patients, which is actually lower than what we saw in, for example, the MAP study or even the loom MISA study, which is more recently performed, in which 100% of those patients had epithelial histology. Yet, if you look at the median overall survival for this patient, population, it's very favorable compared to these other historical series or even modern series at 18.2 months. So back to this uh, patient example, again, medically inoperable, unresectable, epithelioid histology. Um, we had had the approval at that time, again, two years ago now. And so he was actually treated with uh, concurrent carboplatin, pemetrexid, and started TT fields. Now he did start off at about a 57% compliance. He did have this grade two skin blisters. And as Dr. Selman mentioned, we use topical corticosteroid creams um, for this patient to help improve that. The difference is that patients do receive uh, pretty intense chemotherapy. And so after two cycles of chemotherapy, he had significant fatigue, cytopenias, again, not unexpected given his uh, age, and the decline in his performance status. We saw a similar decline in his compliance with his TT fields down to 32%. He did have skin irritation. Again, this was managed with corticosteroid creams. He expressed his preference to continue wearing the device. And then he was able to complete his four cycles of chemotherapy. And then his compliance actually went up afterwards as he didn't have the toxicities from the chemotherapy. And this is his pre-treatment images compared to his post-treatment images and actually still remains controlled to this day. Um, as you can see here, comparative uh, on that CAT scan, you see reduction in that bulky component, especially in the posterior and anterior aspects of that pleural thickening. And then lower down in the lung, you see reduction in that nodular component as well, consistent with a partial response to his treatment. Now, I did want to touch on the radiologic response patterns um, Fuller Seller study in that 72 patients in this trial had at least one follow-up CT scan performed to determine this endpoint of radiologic response rate. Now, the partial response was 40% in those that were valuable. More importantly, the clinical benefit rate, uh, partial response and stable disease, this is something that medical oncology trials uh, typically report out. Um, this was actually 97%. So this is actually much higher than what we see with the traditional systemic therapy alone studies. Also, the median time between the start of treatment and partial response was actually 1.8 months. Again, not a cross comparison across trials, but if you look at, for example, the recent checkmate results with immunotherapy or even with standard chemotherapy, this is typically uh, prolonged at least two to three months afterwards. Now, all patients who presented with a partial response also had continuous reduction in the total sum of the diameters of their tumors, and the median response duration was 5.7 months. So the response rates are similar to those that are reported for the current standard of care therapies, whether they are chemotherapy, chemotherapy and bevacizumab, or even now immunotherapies. But they do last longer with the addition of TT fields. So this led to the FDA approval as a humanitarian use device under the humanitarian device exemption pathway um, for this. And we've been using this in our facility since 2019. We also have a uh, registry for these patients. There are a number of caveats um, that have come up uh, over time and discussions about alternative treatment options. I think these are important to note given that this is a phase two study. The first is, for example, the performance status in the enrolled patients. Again, more than half of the patients had an ECOG of zero. This is higher than what we see in other trials. The second is that there are a subset of patients that may respond very well to TT fields, and there are other subsets that may not respond. You know, we don't have markers of disease response, for example, pdl one status with immunotherapy, but I think we did see a significant benefit in the epithelioid patients, and that is actually very favorable even compared to the immunotherapy data that has been recently published from the Checkmate trial. The progression free survival was less than eight months, and the response rate was 40%. And since the overall survival rate was 18 months, there's always a question of salvage therapies um, in this patient population. But again, even with the most recent studies that have been published, there really hasn't been a difference in salvage therapies um, across different arms. There really aren't any effective salvage therapies as well. <laughs> 
This was a single arm phase two study, so there's obviously a different in, difference in this approval. This is not the level one evidence that Dr. Solomon presented for glioblastoma, and we don't know the optimal duration and compliance. The compliance was a little bit lower on the stellar study compared to what we've seen with the glioblastoma trials, and at least in our clinical experience, it has been a little bit lower than what we'd experience for our GBM patients. Finally, cost is something that always comes to light, but this is not unique to this therapy as we have novel therapies that also have uh, significant high burden of cost. So this is actually provided in your practice aid uh, supplement or even online, um, but hopefully kind of summarizes the current evidence and management approaches for malignant pleural mesothelioma. Initially, actually since 2004, we really had no additional treatment options for this patient population. If you go to the very right in 2019, the FDA approved TT fields in combination with pemetrexid and chemotherapy for patients who met the indication, which was unresectable, locally advanced, or metastatic disease in the first line setting. Most recently, last year, just about this time of the year, um, there was a presentation from the, at the IS, IASLC for nivolumab and ipilimumab for this patient population that then led to its approval. I just pulled here some of the data that has come out from the Lancet publication that there's clearly a benefit in patients who have non-epithelioid histology. The difference in survival was 18.1 months versus 8.8 .8 months. This was a phase three randomized trial. So I think that this is clearly the way to go for this patient population. But for example, for epithelioid patients, for those patients who had a PDL one of less than 1%, or even for the patients who were elderly, we didn't see that stark or significant benefit in overall survival in that subgroup analysis. So for the second half of this uh, thoracic talk, I'm actually just gonna shift the framework to talk about um, the use of TT fields for patients with lung cancer. I think this is an emerging uh, indication um, for our patients. So again, second line options following platinum failure are uh, pretty limited for patients with non-small cell lung cancer. Typically the course is they're diagnosed with metastatic disease. This again, outside of the oligometastatic space that we typically work in. Um, they receive systemic therapy, they have a response evaluation, at some point they will have disease progression. And for patients who have a good performance status at the time of disease progression, um, there are two options essentially, to consider immunotherapy, and it could be dealer's choice of nivolumab, pembrolizumab, or atezolizumab, all have category one recommendations now, or to consider chemotherapy, which is typically done in patients who had failed previous immunotherapy, and that could include docetaxel, pemetrexid, gemcitabine, or even docetaxel remesirumab. So really falling platinum failure, immunotherapy, or single agent cytotoxic chemotherapy are both second line options. This is the phase three lunar trial, which is an ongoing study of TT fields uh, with standard of care chemotherapy for patients who have significant pulmonary disease. This is a study of initially was going to accrue 534 patients who had progressed on or after platinum-based therapy and then randomized in a one-to-one -one, um, ratio to TT fields and either the immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy or docetaxel. This is at the choice or discretion of the treating team. Um, or that systemic therapy alone, and they get a CT scan every six weeks until they have progressive disease. This is a phase three randomized trial, again, so the uh, level of evidence that will come out of this, and the primary endpoint is overall survival. There are a number of secondary endpoints as well, including progression-free survival and overall radiologic response rate. As I said, initially this trial was gonna accrue 534 patients. It has been accruing and actually we underwent uh, interim analysis, which was a routine in February of this year. In April of this year, the DMC, Data Monitoring Committee, actually recommended a reduced sample size of now 276 patients versus 534 patients. And with only 12 months of follow-up, which earlier needed 18 months of follow-up, as it believed that it would provide sufficient overall power for both the primary and the secondary endpoints. So again, this study is accruing right now. We don't have the final outcome, but hopefully we'll be closing soon. There is some data though of the use of TT fields in the recurrent non-small cell lung cancer space. So here is a single arm pilot study, a phase one, two trial in 42 patients who had inoperable stage 3B or stage four non-small cell lung cancer who had tumor progression after at least one line of prior chemotherapy. Now these patients received pemetrexid every three weeks with continuous TT fields at 150 kilohertz of at least 12 hours a day applied to the chest and the upper abdomen until disease progression. 
As you can see here, again, this is compared to a historical cohort, the Pemetrexid versus docetaxel second-line study in lung cancer. The median progression-free survival in this study was 28 weeks versus our historical control of 12 weeks, and the median survival was 13.8 months versus 8.2 months, which is, again, our historical control. And so there is some evidence that we at least have um, of the use and efficacy in this patient population. Now, combining the results from that study, the preclinical or in vitro data from the use of immunotherapy and TT fields, as Dr. Selman had alluded to, and potentially moving this to the first line setting, this is a new trial um, that was recently developed, the phase two keynote B36 trial, um, which is evaluating the use of tumor treating fields therapy and pembrolizumab in the first line setting now. This is trial will uh, accrue 66 patients uh, with unresectable stage 3 and stage 4 non small cell lung cancer that have a PDL1 positivity of at least 1%. Patients receive TT fields and up to 18 hours a day and pembrolizumab every three weeks. The primary endpoint for this study is overall response rate. And there are a number of secondary endpoints as well, including overall survival, progression free survival, one year survival rate, and duration of response. So this is a complicated space. There are a number of novel multimodalities that are being offered and being discovered, at least in lung cancer, but this is at least emerging and the evidence to date has been very favorable. Now, as Dr. Salman mentioned, we have to integrate this as a fourth type of treatment approach outside of the radiation therapy, systemic therapy, and surgery that we traditionally talk to patients about. For this particular device, at least that we have learned, both in the patients that we've treated on our registry with mesothelioma, as well as put on the research setting uh, on the LUNAR study, and then for the newly opened uh, B36 trial, which we're opening, um, patient education is critical to this actual device. It's actually the very few patient population that we're actually allowed to have as visitors um, during this COVID um, era at our facility and that we had patients and their families actually come together um, for these visits. We would teach them about the device. Patient compliance with wearing the device is really key. So I show all of the patients the video about how the technology works. We actually have the device in the room um, with the patient if we are going to be discussing either the study or the registry. And then continuous monitoring is needed. It is beneficial to actually review the device support specialist um, uh, feedback about the patient, uh, to review the reports um, with the patients in clinic so you can identify potential challenges that they're having, whether they're taking breaks during a certain period of times. And it's something that you can actually monitor um, in pseudo real time with your monthly reports. So you can have those discussions with patients to ensure uh, that they remain compliant with the device. Uh, well, let's move on now after that really excellent uh, presentation uh, now to Dr. Horn who is uh, from the Division of Radiation Oncology at Allegheny Health Network in Pittsburgh. So thank you, Dr. Horn. Thank you, Dr. Solman. Uh, so I get the, I think the most fun part of this talk where I get to talk about a lot of things that are in the pipeline uh, and the ways in which we can combine tumor treating fields with other modalities of therapy, uh, namely radiation for one, uh, that we are already using to fight cancers that have been proven, uh, that have been proven to be difficult to get rid of cancer-related mortality rates in solid malignancy still remain difficult to move the needle on. Um, we have a number of traditional therapies, uh, systemic therapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, radiation, sometimes surgery, even in the metastatic setting, that all have associated adverse effects and impact quality of life. And so we need to find better ways of combining novel treatment strategies, such as TT fields, with the weapons that we already have uh, to move that needle without adversely impacting quality of life. I'm going to start off by talking about pancreatic cancer. Preclinical data indicates that the combination of tumor treating fields and gemcitabine gave a high level of tumor reduction uh, in, uh, in, in cell cultures and that a frequency of 150 kilohertz was the optimal frequency, as we've seen in other disease sites, uh, for reducing the proliferative pr potential of those cancer cell lines. Similar to the thoracic arrays, it uses four transducer arrays that are this time placed across the, the abdomen, uh, across the front, the sides, and the back, uh, to deliver the tumor treating field effect to the pancreatic tumors. And there is data from the PANOVA trial which 
enrolled 40 patients in combined gemcitabine and tumor treating fields in locally advanced pancreatic cancer that was not amenable to surgery uh, and found that progression-free survival was eight, almost eight and a half months and overall survival was nearly 15 months. Uh, there was also a cohort of patients that were treated with gemcitabine and abraxane in combination with tumor treating fields. And those patients enjoyed an even better progression-free survival and median overall survival was not reached in that uh, cohort of patients. And you can see the progression-free survival curves and overall survival curves there at the bottom on the left and right, respectively. And you can see, of course, as it would follow that locally advanced patients had much better outcomes than those with metastatic disease, as the disease outside of the tumor treating fields would not be addressed uh, by that therapy and would only be reached by chemotherapy. In comparison with standard uh, therapy for pancreatic cancer, we can see that the historical data for gemcitabine and abraxane, median progression-free survival is only about five and a half months. Uh, median overall survival was eight and a half months, not yet reached with the addition of tumor treating fields and that landmark one year survival is more than doubled at 72%. Partial response rates are in the 40% range versus only about one in four responding with, uh, with chemotherapy and the clinical benefit rate, that disease control rate of stable disease and partial response rate is in close to 90%, whereas it's only one in two with standard chemotherapy. So this indicates that the addition of tumor treating fields really is a separate uh, independent mechanism of action that has helped driving tumor cell kill. That led to the phase three randomized PANOVA-3 trial, which is currently ongoing. And it is taking that single arm of tumor treating fields with abraxane and gemcitabine and randomizing it against systemic therapy alone. Patients are being followed every four weeks in the clinic with CT scans every two months, and they're followed until pr local progression. The primary endpoint of that study is overall survival. And again, a number of important secondary endpoints, including progression-free survival. Local progression-free survival is again, the tumor treating fields are only uh, effective at the pancreatic tumor site. And if there are uh, disease sites outside of there, they would not be impacted. Overall re response rates, landmark one year survival, and of course, quality of life and pain-free survival, which I think is a very interesting endpoint for this uh, particular study. Uh, and there are also some other additional endpoints, including resectability rate, uh, to see if some of these patients are converted from being inoperable to being potentially operable. There are, uh, as with the non-small cell lung cancer space, a myriad of studies ongoing in locally advanced pancreatic cancer, uh, looking at adding intra-arterial chemotherapy, the nano knife, modified chemotherapy regimens, uh, and nanoparticulates, all of which are very exciting and potentially could help, again, move that needle in a very difficult to manage disease. Moving slightly across the abdomen, uh, we'll talk about hepatocellular carcinomas and gastric cancers. Novacure ran the phase two HEPANOVA trial in advanced hepatocellular carcinomas uh, using TT fields, again, at the 150 kilohertz range concurrent with first-line serafinib uh, for advanced and unresectable HCC patients. Uh, there was 25 patients enrolled on that study, uh, and they were treated with daily serafinib and the tumor treating fields and imaged every three months until disease progression. You can see the schematic of how the arrays were placed. Uh, they had two arrays on the flanks, one anterior and one posterior. Um, and the phase two HEPANOVA study ended up enrolling 27 patients. Uh, you can see that the child turcot pew uh, stage was fairly severe in the enrolled patients. The median duration of therapy was only nine weeks. It was relatively short. Uh, but what we did see is that disease control rate was obtained in three quarters of patients. The overall response rate was only 10% um, in the overall population. If they were able to be treated for more than 12 weeks, which was 11 patients, so roughly half, uh, the disease control rate went up to 90% and the overall response rate was doubled at 18%. In comparison to historical control, these numbers are favorable. And this has led to a phase three randomized trial, uh, changing the uh, backbone for comparison with the new standard of care, which is the tezolizumab and bevacizumab instead of serafinib, as that is no longer the standard when the phase two study was designed. 
and it has been granted FDA breakthrough uh, designation in HCC. There's also an abstract presented earlier today uh, demonstrating that the ma maximal efficacy of TT fields in hepatocellular carcinoma is also achieved at that 150 kilohertz uh, threshold. In gastric cancer, we also have phase two uh, data that is ongoing. Uh, patients who are being treated with the tumor treating fields and concurrent Zlox chemotherapy, um, who are being imaged every three weeks, uh, or sorry, being treated every three weeks and imaged every three months until progression. Uh, it's again going to be a small study uh, and designed to determine the overall response rates uh, of that combination as there is preclinical data, again, that the combination of TT fields and Fulfox uh, had a higher level of cell kill than either treatment alone. So again, suggesting that there is a synergistic effect here. So now we're going to move into the pelvis, uh, tumor treating fields for therapy in ovarian cancer. There's also phase two data in the platinum resistant ovarian cancer uh, setting, which is something that radiation oncologists traditionally are excluded from, uh, except for perhaps in some palliative instances. Uh, we, don't, we don't get to participate in the care of these patients terribly often. Uh, but in this setting, uh, tumor treating fields tuned to a frequency of 200 kilohertz, uh, so slightly different from most of the settings that we've been talking about, uh, have, were demonstrated to have a, an anti-proliferative effect in cell lines, and it led to the phase two study of examining TT fields with weekly paclitaxel in women with platinum-resistant ovarian cancer. Most were serous type, uh, and the median number of prior treatment lines was four, so these are very heavily treated women. And you can see here that the median progression-free survival was about nine months, and in comparison with historical control of paclitaxel by itself, that is more than doubling of progression-free survival. Overall so survival was not reached at the median time point, whereas with paclitaxel, that's typically just over a year. And the landmark one-year survival with TT fields and paclitaxel was almost two-thirds of women. Uh, disease control rate was 71%, and only one patient had to discontinue the use of TT fields due to dermatitis. That, of course, led to the phase three Innovate, uh, Innovate 3 trial, uh, looking again at uh, women with platinum-resistant ovarian cancer, taking that same combination of therapy, TT fields with weekly taxol, and comparison, com comparing it to weekly taxol by itself. These women are scanned every eight weeks until progression of disease. Primary endpoint is overall survival, uh, and secondary endpoints include progression-free and uh, overall response rates. This is going to be a fairly large study and is currently accruing. It's also a very busy space. There are a lot of ongoing studies in the platinum refractory ovarian space, uh, looking at checkpoint inhibitors, possibly combined with radiation, uh, engineered uh, T-cell therapy, SBRT, TACE uh, in the hepatocellular arena, um, different immunotherapies, and, and for biliary tract uh, cancers, looking at immunotherapy, checkpoint inhibitors, and radiation. Uh, so there's a lot of exciting work being done in all of these spaces right now. So there are some future directions where I think this multimodal approach, the, the fourth treatment modality, as it were, um, I think really can have a, a great deal of promise. Um, tumor treating fields and radiation have complementary non-overlapping mechanisms of action, as was pointed out earlier, radiation being ionizing radiation and tumor treating fields being non-ionizing radiation. We've noted in, in preclinical studies that DNA damage repair is delayed after delivery of radiation and use of concurrent tumor treating fields. Tumor treating fields can actually interfere with repair of double-strand DNA breaks uh, and increase the expression of gamma H2AX, uh, also uh, a marker of double-strand DNA breaks. And so you can theoretically increase cell kill by combining these two modalities vis-a-vis -vis the Trident trial, which is currently ongoing. Um, and, and there's a potential to really harness these two separate mechanisms of action uh, for a super additive effect of cell kill wherein you, you can destroy more cancer cells combined that rather than uh, the number of cells killed with each modality individually.
mouse models do suggest that tumor treating fields are immunostimulatory. Um, and so there may be greater potential for harnessing the power of checkpoint inhibitors, for instance, uh, PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors uh, with tumor treating fields. There may be some upregulation of those markers in tumor cells that, again, produces a super additive effect of the modalities when combined as opposed to when they're used individually. There's also some early preclinical data that tumor treating fields induce a state of BRCA ness in tumor cells. Um, and so women with BRCA mutations are eligible for treatment with PARP inhibitors. Uh, and those have demonstrated by themselves excellent response rates uh, for those patients. And if tumor treating fields can induce this BRCA ness state, uh, sort of like HRD, um, we may be able to make available another option for these patients by inducing a BRCA ness state and treating them with a, a PARP inhibitor, perhaps. Um, they may also be more susceptible to radiation in that state. Uh, so I think there's a lot of interesting research to be done in that arena uh, and a number of interesting clinical trials that could be put forth in the coming years. So we need to prepare for the future. Uh, there's a, a great deal of importance on the multidisciplinary and multimodal care of all patients with cancer, but especially in these patients with difficult to treat metastatic or locally advanced disease. Novel techniques, including tumor treating fields and combined modality treatments, may improve the ability to control tumors for longer without impacting quality of life. And there are a number of confirmatory prospective trials underway that will shed light on which options we have beyond chemotherapy, TKIs, immunotherapy, and other treatment, op, uh, treatment strategies. So there is hope. Uh, excellent. So we have uh, an opportunity now to go through the really outstanding questions uh, that, um, uh, that have been provided. And I'm going to, since a lot of these, and in, in, in understandably, involve uh, glioblastoma, I'm going to kind of share the wealth a little bit with my colleagues because uh, they have experience uh, beyond that, uh, beyond just the areas they've covered. Um, I'll answer a few of these uh, relatively quickly. Um, someone asked about the Trident trial, whether it would be uh, whether it's blinded or whether there's a sham tumor treating field device. And there is not. Uh, just like the EF14 trial there and the EF11 trial, there's no sham device. Uh, and I would just say that there's been a lot of discussion over the years whether a sham device means anything, whether there's a placebo effect. And the data really does not support a placebo effect having a survival impact in a clinical trial. Uh, and then another, the same question, uh, a person asked if tumor treating fields is effective in disrupting mitoses. Why do we only see a few months OS improvement? Again, that's median overall survival improvement, uh, but we see a near doubling in survival t percentages uh, at uh, two, three, four, and five years. Um, and the mechanisms of resistance are asked about, and that's uh, an active area of investigation. Uh, and may overlap somewhat with some of the resistance we see with ionizing radiation. Why don't you take one? We'll sure. set up a little. Uh, this question is for PANOVA-3, the locally advanced pancreatic cancer study. Can patients receive pancreatic-directed radiation at some point in therapy? Uh, the study excludes radiation while on therapy, but then, of course, after the patients progress, they can be treated with radiation. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to hand you that. Okay. Sorry, we got to divvy up here a little bit. Um, I'm going to hand you that. Okay, I'll, I'll do a, a get through a couple of these I can get through quickly. Uh, somebody asked if tumor treating fields are appropriate for lower grade gliomas. Uh, we simply don't know. Uh, we don't have the clinical evidence yet uh, to support that. And those trials, as uh, you may know, whoever asked this, are, are quite difficult uh, because they already have a, a fairly long survival. And so uh, it's... Uh, as I always say, if you do research in low-grade gliomas, your uh, children and grandchildren will be reporting the results. <laughs> so, um, uh, I know you can take that one if you want, or you want to ask one of yours? Sure. Yeah. So I can start with uh, two here. So the first one is um, a radiation oncologist who's trained in TT fields for GBM, but how do they transition to the use in, in other disease sites, uh, for example, mesothelioma? 
So you just have to look at the approval process um, for these uh, different indications. For example, for mesothelioma, that was approved uh, under the humanitarian, um, as a humanitarian use device under the humanitarian device exemption pathway. Um, what that means is that in addition to the training on the device, uh, which the company will provide you, and if you're already um, used to it, and a lot of the principles are the same, um, you just also need to have either a local committee or an IRB uh, approved um, uh, indication for use. Now that can be done at your own institution. For example, when we started that back in 2019, um, we went through our own institution and have renewed a registry. Um, but most of the institutions now are just using a third party IRB. It's very easy to set up. And at the time of your training, um, the company can actually take care of a lot of that submission uh, for you and your hospital system. The second question, I think, was the role of radiation therapy in the Stellar trial. And I'll probably use that as to how do we use it in clinical practice. So this was not used in the Stellar study. Those patients actually just started their treatment with um, chemotherapy and TT fields therapy. But I think in clinical practice, it's very common that the patients have some degree of symptoms related to their chest wall disease. Uh, the way that we approach all these patients at our facility is that we uh, see them on the first day, we simulate them, and then essentially at that time, we'll actually put in for the approval for their TT fields um, for their treatment. All of our patients are treated to 40 gray and 10 fractions, a very common mesothelioma palliative regimen given the radio resistance of that disease. And essentially, they'll finish their treatment, and as soon as they're done, um, they'll start their chemotherapy and their TT fields treatment. And that actually window works out well for how long it takes to get the device approved and then do their teaching. Um, you do, we, although we haven't seen yet the results um, from these ongoing studies in the brain, we do reduce the, reduce the dose to the skin um, or, or use any specific planning constraints uh, given some, some of these skin disease or, or it could be superficial disease. Uh, I'm going to just uh, uh, go through a couple of quick ones here. Do, I, do we go beyond 24 months since the trial stopped at 24 months for glioblastoma? I, I do go beyond 24 months if the, if the patient is willing uh, especially if they haven't uh, progressed or maybe they only had one progression. Uh, like many trials, you have to have a fixed treatment endpoint, uh, and 24 months was chosen, but that doesn't mean it stops working at, at that arbitrary time. Um, uh, is it been, is optune tumor treating fields shown to be useful in molecular glioblastoma? Uh, undoubtedly, there were probably some in there, but of course the trials used a histologic diagnosis of glioblastoma uh, so we can't, I can't definitively say that that's true, and I think the WHO guidelines that are coming out in 2021, uh, which really re-engineer uh, a lot of the brain tumor classification, are going to complicate our interpretation of clinical trials across the board, well beyond the field of tumor-treating fields, and that is just one example. Um, um, here, one, one, you know, I'll, I'll hand that to you. We'll let you sure. do a few questions. Uh, so there's one, any role for liver mis metastases in future trials? Um, I think that's a very interesting question. There are no current studies uh, on undergoing. Um, there may be some issues with tuning the fields in that kind of study because they would be of a variety of histologies, but um, certainly that might be a, a very reasonable uh, space to explore, especially now in light of uh, the HEPA-NOVA study uh, launching will have good safety data, at least from that standpoint. Uh, I have another series of questions. Uh, what are my thoughts, and, and you can both chime in on this, on who should be prescribing tumor-treating fields? Um, I think that really depends on the disease site. Uh, I think it makes sense for radiation oncologists to help manage glioblastoma patients, non-small cell lung cancer patients, um, because we have a large stake uh, in their care. There are other patients like the platinum refractory ovarian cancer patients who we would be entering a new arena and may not be familiar with uh, all of the aspects of their care, and so GYN oncologists tend to manage that. So I think it does vary. Um, who should be dosing and monitoring the TTF? The dosing is standard. That's set uh, based on the clinical trial. Um, but in terms of monitoring, I think it is the onus falls upon the prescriber of the TT fields to make sure that those patients are coming in for the routine imaging, routine clinical assessment, managing their skin, um, and, and by an extension, having your staff trained uh, for the implementation and management, uh, you know, knowing the questions to ask, and, the, and Novacure is very helpful uh, in educating your staff on how to manage the device asking the appropriate questions about skin toxicity, what are patients doing in terms of their array changing routines, et cetera. Um, so the, the company is a very good resource for that. 
I'll give you some. Sure. So I have a question here um, about GBM, and I'll also probably answer it for mesothelioma, but on the compliance rates um, for patients um, wearing the device on their head. So at least in the EF14 trial, um, the compliance rate for at least 18 hours a day was about 75%, and so that's been used in, in other studies as well. Um, in the Stellar study, it was actually down to 68%, so 16, I think, 0.3 hours. Um, so a little bit less than the 18 hours a day. Um, but you do self-select out the patients who are you're interested in the dis device. You know, I think it's not a large uptick at the very beginning for the patients, though, who ask to wear the device or were seeking it, or when we discuss it with patients in the clinic who are interested in it. I mean, those are patients that are self-selecting themselves to probably be more compliant with it. You just have to manage the skin-related toxicities associated with it. I would just uh, add that uh it's important not to make any assumptions about a patient uh, and their willingness to, to use the device. Mm -hmm. um, really, uh, certainly for glioblastoma, uh, this is standard of care, should be offered to all patients. Uh, some say, well, women will never use it because they don't want to shave their head. Uh, I actually have more women than men that use it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, when it comes to uh, uh, really wanting to improve survival, I think uh, hair is often a secondary consideration for most mm -hmm. people. But in general, it's really important to objectively present the information, the data, just as you would temozolomide or the use of, of uh, radiation itself. Uh, someone uh, asked for uh, whether we should be using the preoperative T2, or I guess flare MRI for uh, TT field planning. Uh, it, this hasn't been done. I think the key reason is just because of the changes induced by radiation and the time period between uh, a preoperative study uh, and uh, the end of radiation when you'd be giving adjuvant therapy is several months. So I think the tumor has really uh, evolved at that point, uh, and the imaging is really uh, very complex. Um, this was a really interesting question. Because of the orthogonal placement of the fields, somebody asked if we should use, uh, we should be using a rotating field to give better results. Uh, fascinating idea, uh, but I could conceive doing it, uh, simply alter it, alternating which array in a circular motion is getting it, uh, would need some preclinical studies. Did I leave you with some more? I have a couple, yeah. Um, these are all sort of related to immunotherapy. Uh, one, do TT field sensitize patients for PDL1 or PD1 inhibitors or vice versa? That we don't have an answer to from preclinical data. Uh, and then there's a, two questions sort of similar about the mechanistic rationale for combining TT fields and immunotherapy. Uh, there's preclinical data that TT fields upregulate PDL1 expression um, and therefore might make patients more uh, susceptible to that kind of therapy. Okay, I think we are actually out of time, uh, but uh, I want to thank. Uh, my colleagues up here on the, on the podium, uh, thank you. This activity is accredited by Medical Learning Institute, Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.